Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the MD2K Center, I would like to welcome you to our first webinar of 2016. Our speaker today is Dr. Santosh Kumar. Uh, Dr. Kumar is the Lillian and Maury Moss Chair of Excellence Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Memphis. And uh, he's also widely known as the director of the MD2K Center, which studies mobile sensor data to knowledge. Um, Dr. Kumar has got his PhD at the Ohio State University, and he has received many honors, including being named one of the 10 most brilliant scientists under the age of 38. And today he will be talking about MD2K's um, recent research on puff marker, which is a multi-sensor approach for pinpointing the timing of the first lapse in smoking cessation. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kumar. Hey, thank you, Barbara, for your kind introduction. Let me add my welcome to the audience for uh, of, of another MD2K webinar. Uh, <clears throat> so before I proceed, I would like to thank several individuals who have made this work possible. Uh, so in addition to thanking NIH for their support uh, to, for researching this topic, uh, there have been contributions by many individuals. First, this work was led by the students uh, in, uh, at the University of Memphis who have worked on this topic for quite some time. Uh, Najir, Amin, Monover, Hilol, Sojanya. And then our uh, collaborators, Ben Marlin, uh, Emre Ertin, Mustafa Alab, and Mustafa Alabsi. So in addition to those who are named as co-authors on the paper, there are several individuals, conversations with whom has shaped our thinking. Uh, and I would like to name them as well before I delve into this particular topic. So uh, our thinking on this topic began right in 2007 when uh, Dr. K. Wang Ki, uh, who was at NIDA at that time, and uh, Dr. Bill Riley, who is currently uh, the director of OBSSR, uh, and several others expressed a desire to, for us to work on detecting smoking using sensors. Then in 2012, uh, we published the first work in this space, and we developed a model to detect the smoking using respiration. But the model was not good enough to be deployed in the field because its accuracy was about 87%, so that means there were still 13% false positive in classifying each breathing uh, cycle as puff or not puff. So we continued this work, and then uh, in 2014, our colleague uh, Deepak Ganeshan at UMass Amherst and his students, led by Avinav uh, Parate, they uh, developed a model to detect, uh, to recognize hand gestures involved in smoking and eating behaviors. And uh, the students uh, who are here at University of Memphis who worked on this puff marker, they have been inspired by their uh, by their work that was published in Movisys 2014 that was called Risk RISQ. So, uh, uh, and more more recently, our uh, thinking has been uh, also informed by conversations with Dr. Bonnie Spring uh, and uh, Dr. David Wetter. Bonnie Spring is at Northwestern Medical School and leads the smoking cessation uh, aspect of research for MD2K. And Dr. David Wetter, he is at Rice and he leads uh, an, an independent R01 that is also using this type of market approach for detecting smoking. So, <clears throat> So uh, I mean, with that introduction and acknowledgement, uh, let's uh, proceed with this particular work, Puff Marker, which is a multi-sensor approach to pinpoint the timing of first lapse in a smoking cessation. So there are several risks from smoking. Uh, and I should acknowledge that many of the slides are prepared by Najir, uh, the first author of this paper. He is on the call and will be available to answer questions towards the end of this presentation. So there are several risks from smoking that are widely known. And it's also known that it is a pretty deadly behavior to engage in. Uh, it uh, costs uh, the public health. It costs, uh, I mean, has several adverse consequences on the, on the health of not only the smoker, but those uh, I mean, uh, who are exposed to secondhand smoke as well. Uh, it is recognized as the highest cause of mortality. Uh, 
responsible for one in five deaths. And the issue is that there is a large gap between when uh, when the smoking uh, uh, occurs and when its uh, harmful health effects begin to or serious health effects begin to appear, and that makes it very hard to motivate people to give up smoking. So uh, uh, a lot of the daily smokers they understand the risks from smoking and they do try do, uh, try their best to quit, but uh, I mean, very few succeed and uh, most of them end up lapsing. And so it is very hard to quit, uh, not only because it's hard to motivate, but it's also because uh, I mean, uh, the dependence is pretty strong. <clears throat> <clears throat> Another uh, factor in the uh, cessation failure or quit failure is that the uh, smoking uh, lapse is pretty momentary. And so uh, I mean, when people try to quit, they remain abstinent for a certain time. And then so at, uh, I mean, they enter a high risk situation and they uh, lapse, meaning take a puff or a couple of puffs or few puffs, thinking that they will be able to uh, I mean, regain their uh, their abstinence status but uh, so that means they have a moment of failure uh, when they are exposed to certain cues or they are going under stress or they are exposed to alcohol uh, for a variety of factors but the research shows that as soon as they do that that means when they lapse for the first time most of them go back to becoming uh, a, a fully uh, or ad lib smokers again so, <clears throat> are the regular smokers again? So, therefore, it is very important to find a way to help people remain abstinent and prevent first lapse. So, if suppose we have a way to detect smoking or, or the first lapse in smoking using sensors, we can initiate interventions right on the mobile phone in the right moment. Uh, for two purposes. One, uh, if we detect a first lapse, uh, perhaps it's too late, uh, too late to prevent the first lapse, but we could still uh, engage or deliver interventions or counseling or therapy to prevent subsequent lapse. Now that such a method of detecting a smoking lapse exists, such uh, treatments can now be investigated <clears throat> and uh, user studies can be undertaken. Uh, even more useful but harder is to find those high-risk situations that could be detected by sensors that precede the first lapse. Could be stress, could be craving, could be cue exposure, and use those uh, triggers that are detected by sensors to deliver a preemptive intervention or proactive intervention that will help keep the smoker remain abstinent. So uh, with those uh, from, uh, promising uh, benefit and potential, so uh, I mean, it's important to find, or it's uh, very useful if we could find a way to detect smoking from sensors. So to do so, uh, I mean, we collected uh, I mean, data, we identified two sensors, one, uh, the respiration sensor that we had used initially because there is a unique breathing pattern during smoking, deep inhalation and exhalation. And then there is a gesture of hand to mouth that is also involved during smoking. So our, our approach is to combine both of these sensors, so that measurements from both of these sensors, so that they can complement each other and help reduce the false alarm arising from either of them when used alone. For training purposes, we collected data from six smokers for 40 hours where each of their puffs were marked by, uh, on the mobile phone that was receiving the sensor data by an observer. And then to t uh, the model was tested on a smoking cessation data collected at University of Minnesota Medical School uh, of, under the supervision of Dr. Mustafa Lavsi, a co-author on, on this article. <clears throat> and this data consisted of uh, 61 daily smokers who wore the sensors for one day before quitting and three days up after quitting. 
So a lot of data uh, was collected using sensors. Of this 61 uh, participants, 28 remain abstinent during the three days of our observation and 33 lapsed. Each participant wore a respiration sensor suite in the AutoSense uh, suite and, uh, and uh, to capture breathing pattern and then a wrist set watch that had a three axis accelerometer and three axis gyroscope to recognize hand to hand to mouth gestures. So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, our, in our approach, we have both of the sensors worn by participants uh, so that the breathing pattern as well as the hand movements are captured continuously. The data is sent or streamed wirelessly to a mobile phone. Uh, that collects timestamps this data, and then uh, that's uh, where the model is uh, can be applied to detect the smoking uh, episode, the smoking puffs, which can be constructed into a smoking episode. So, and from those we can recognize the uh, labs. <clears throat> So first, uh, we embarked upon uh, looking as to whether it is feasible to recognize these smoking lapses with high accuracy in the field, given so, I mean, so many variations in how people could engage in smoking. For example, people could smoke while they are standing or seated or walking or even driving or talking. So there are a variety of situations. So we first looked at these three scenarios to see are there sufficient distinct signature, visually speaking, that point to a uh, discriminatory uh, information. That means that whether there is sufficient information to build a detector. So what you see here are measurements from gyroscope that measures angular acceleration, so angular movement. What you see, is that on, uh, on the top figures of uh, during standing, walking, or sitting, in all cases, there is a signature of the hand moving. If the person is standing, then it's pretty clean that in between uh, the hand going to the mouth and coming back from the mouth, that uh, there is not much movement, but during walking or during seated positions, there, there are still some movements in between. And then there is, a, uh, there is a strong signal of hand coming away from the mouth. <clears throat> and if you, so therefore this, uh, this particular uh, window of hand going to the mouth and then staying at the mouth and then coming away from the mouth that those are the periods that represent a puff and that's what we seek to isolate and locate in this time series of sensor data then there are accelerometer measurements of as well on the wrist and of what we aim to identify from accelerometer is whether the hand uh, indeed reached the mouth and stayed at the mouth. And as you can see, there are strong signals in the y-axis of accelerometer as well. Uh, y-axis is the green, uh, green signal. <clears throat> uh, so uh, we can look at the orientation of the hand as well from the accelerometers because accelerometer measurements are affected by gravity. So, so therefore, we can identify the orientation of the hand. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the signal of signals that are enclosed in this uh, boxes, that's what we are seeking to identify or I isolate. Next, we also looked at uh, uh, I mean, other activities that a user engages in daily life because these sensors are to be worn day in, day out. So, and people do a variety of different things. So, the ones that look closely related to smoking are eating. And uh, so, we looked at the eating uh, signatures, and the eating signatures do look different than the smoking signatures, both on the on the hand movement because the hand orientation is different, and then uh, the respiration signal is different as well because the smoking puff involves one deep inhalation exhalation, whereas eating uh, involves regular uh, eating and holding of the breath for uh, for swallowing. 
But there are some, so that, so for what I just now presented uh, points to the feasibility of spending effort to try to develop a computational model. But there are several challenges. So first, uh, the a puff is a really short, very short, uh, I mean, bout of activity during the entire day. If you think a person wears a sensor for 10 hours every day, actually in our studies, they have worn sensors for much more than 10 hours, 14, 16 hours. So even if they wear for 10 hours, there are 10,000 breaths in, one, in, in this 10 hours. And uh, each puff takes just three to four seconds. There are 2,000 hand-to-mouth gestures during this time. But only six to seven positive instances exist in all these many uh, instances. So it is indeed like looking for a needle in the haystack. So we need a very high recall and low false alarm rate if we indeed expect this model to be useful in detecting first laps. And uh, I mean, this model again will not be useful if suppose eating is confused with smoking, even if few bites of eating are confused with a first lapse, because first lapse is the most clinically significant event, it will indeed uh, may not be very useful. There are data quality issues as well, like physical movement that can cause misplacement of the sensors, uh, uh, slippage of the sensor, there are attachment degradation, respiration band can become loose uh, because the data from sensors are streamed wirelessly to the mobile phone continuously throughout the entire day. Data could be lost in the wireless channel. And then there are these numerous confounding factors that could cause us to mistake uh, or falsely detect a puff when there does not exist one. Then for the specificity part of it, as uh, <clears throat> uh, then for the sensitivity part of it. So thus far, confounders I mean, can have an effect on a specificity. But for the sensitivity itself, I mean, there are so many different ways a person could smoke or could hold a cigarette. So that presents wide between person variability. Then for the same person, they could be smoking while they are driving, while they are walking, while they are seated, while they are talking. And, uh, and so on. So that represents significant situational variability. So, uh, so now I'm going to describe the model that the students developed to uh, that was able to, uh, that resulted into us have, having a fairly accurate detection of smoking lapses. So the first step is the data pre-processing. So I mean, uh, Nobody uh, is looking at the data visually. This is a vast amount of data streaming continuously. So we need a method to first tell whether the person is wearing the sensor or not. So we shouldn't be applying our method on a sensor that is lying idle or is, uh, I mean, is in the backpack or somewhere else. Then if there are small periods of missing data, then I mean, we could uh, impute them so that several data mining methods can be applied on them. Uh, <clears throat> The next is, uh, I mean, remember I talked about hand uh, I mean, reaching the mouth, then staying at the mouth, and then coming out, coming back from the mouth. So that th that's what we call an episode, which we seek to locate in this time series, continuous time series of sensor data. So that's like time series pattern identification. So, <clears throat> so what you see here, uh, those uh, I mean, those vertical I mean, mar of markings labeled A, that's where the hand is reaching the mouth. Then B is where the yellow portion is where the hand is staying at the mouth. And, and C denotes the time when the hand is coming out from the mouth. So, so that to identify those, uh, I mean, the challenge here that we need to deal with is to find the right thresholds so that we can tell apart when hand is indeed moving uh, I mean, towards the mouth or hand, hand is moving away from the mouth on, uh, under a variety of different circumstances, when the person may be walking, when the person may be seated, when the person may be standing, when the person may be driving. So there could be significant differences and all of that could affect the gyroscope measurements on the wrist. So therefore we need an adaptive approach. So we used an adaptive approach called uh, moving average convergence divergence that we use to adapt the signal to the current level of movement to still be able to identify when this change happens. That means when the hand is reaching to the mouth and be able to fairly accurately tell 
as to when in the time series of sensor data that event occurs, both hand reaching to the mouth and hand coming away from the mouth. Next uh, <clears throat> is uh, I mean, be able to tell, now suppose we have located that there is this particular uh, of, uh, instance of hand reaching the mouth and coming away from the mouth, then we, we want to look, is it indeed for a smoking or for something else? I mean, like fixing the eyeglasses or I mean, for eating or for any other purpose. So first thing we look for is that whether the duration of movement is something that is representative or likely to occur during smoking. So we look at, we use the training data from the lab to find the mean and the standard deviation. And we set this threshold at mean plus minus three standard deviations. And you see the specific numbers in here. That means if the duration of hand staying at the mouth is between 0 0.8 second and five second, then this is, uh, if, uh, this is likely to be a smoking puff. Then is the degree of movement sufficient that hand indeed was getting to the mouth and not, uh, I mean, say, gestures we make during a conversation? So we look at the appropriate degree of movement and we have identified uh, from the degree of movement as well, a threshold that should be exceeded and that's 50 degrees per second. The next thing is, uh, I mean, so hand can reach the mouth, but for different purposes, it can reach the mouth for eating purposes or for I mean, uh, touching your nose or I mean, uh, touching the eyeglasses or for I mean, touching the hair, I mean, for various other purposes. So if it is indeed for smoking, then it, uh, I mean, we, we identify that by a specific orientation of the hand. And for that, we compute the roll and pitch uh, from the accelerometry data. And remember, when we are computing this roll and pitch, the hand is stationary at the mouth. So what you see here are I mean, the uh, puffs versus non-puffs of, I mean, of plotted for the roll and pitch. And you see that uh, I mean, we can rule many of the non-puffs out with, with simple thresholds on both the roll and the pitch. Next. Uh, when we identify the candidate respiration cycle that is associated with the hand coming to the mouth and staying at the mouth and then hand leaving the mouth. And then we compute various features, uh, both from respiration sensors uh, and from the hand gestures. So features like uh, inhalation duration, that means was there a long inhalation, acceleration duration, whether the acceleration was unusually long, then uh, the total respiration duration, then inspiration to expiration duration ratio and the stretch, that means how, uh, how uh, I mean, uh, that's on the amplitude axis, that means was the inhalation or exhalation deep or deeper than usual. <clears throat> Next, we developed a uh, support vector machine classifier uh, that was trained on the lab data that consisted of 291 puffs and 3,500 non-puffs. Uh, and then we uh, developed three classifier, one that was just using respiration, one that was just using wrist sensor, and one that was combined to, I mean, for two purposes. One, we wanted to see uh, how, uh, how critical is it to have both sensors? And second, to see, uh, I mean, uh, can we, uh, uh, what the feasibility of having a wrist-only model, because wearing a wrist sensor is a lot more convenient than having a, uh, a belt around your chest to measure respiration. So after, developing, after applying the SVM model, uh, we apply some further post-processing to improve the accuracy of the model. So first, uh, when we, treat, uh, uh, we look at any puff detections that are by themselves, then we rule them out because we here we are assuming that single puffs uh, I mean, do not represent a smoking episode. And we will deal with that issue later after the presentation about what about detecting individual puffs. And uh, so that can be done as well. But at this point, let's suppose that smoking episodes do not consist of a single puff. So we rule them out. So to rule them out, we look at the uh, time between successive uh, 
Uh, sorry, uh, I, was, uh, I was talking about isolated puffs. So <clears throat> and then uh, also want to talk about the uh, uh, non-dominant hand versus dominant hand. So I'll uh, discuss the non-dominant hand versus dominant hand at towards the end of the presentation. Let me right now talk about removal of the isolated puff. <clears throat> So how do we tell whether the whether two puffs are uh, <clears throat> uh, isolated or not? So, <clears throat> so what we do is we look at the time between the puffs. So again, we look use our training data. Uh, we look at the time between successive puffs, and if the time between successive puffs that we see in when we are applying the model is unusually long which means that it's more than three standard deviations away from the mean of mean between in uh, successive puffs then we mark those as isolated puffs and then those are discarded or excluded from analysis in this version of the model as i said we we can also talk about a version of the model that detects individual puffs in which case this step will be not performed so uh, <clears throat> so next we sought to identify as to uh, I mean, if we want to make the model more sensitive, that means detecting in single puffs or detecting uh, I mean, uh, uh, first, first lapses that only consists of two puffs or three puffs or four puffs. So as we ask the model to be more sensitive, its false alarm uh, I mean, will be higher. So that's what you see in this graph. So we tried uh, I mean, to enforce that the smoking episode must consist of at least two puffs. So in, in that case, we'll have a false alarm rate that is pretty high, which is, I mean, as you can see on the right-hand side, it's 1.6 false alarm, false episode detection per day. But, in, uh, but the recall ratio is actually 100%. So that means in this particular data set, each smoking lapse, first laps consisted of at least two smoking puffs. So if we move further up to uh, demanding at least three puffs be there in each episode, then we have a lower false positive rate, which is about 0 0.6 per day. So roughly one every two days. If we inst instead have four puffs, uh, that means we detect those episodes that consist of at least four puffs, then we don't have as high of a recall. That means we detect, uh, so we have a recall rate of about 87%, but the false episode of rate reduces to one every six days. So pretty low false positive rate. If we move further down to five, uh, five uh, smoking puffs in every episode, then we see that recall rate reduces pretty uh, I mean, drastically, but we don't get much benefit in terms of uh, false positive rate. <clears throat> so, uh, so which uh, I mean, so which means that uh, I mean, the ideal scenario or the best case that we found in terms of this trade-off analysis is to ask for four puffs in each episode, and that's the version of the model I'll present. Up until up until towards the end of the presentation, when we can talk about detection of single puffs. So for this, uh, I mean, ask, uh, having insisting that each episode consists of four puffs, we get a false alarm rate of one every six days. So for evaluation, uh, we'll first talk about the training data, uh, I mean, because then we can uh, plot the entire ROC curve. Uh, <clears throat> So here you see the ROC curve from the training data uh, of respiration-only model, wrist-only model, and when we use the respiration plus wrist both, as we can see, that's the red curve. As we can see, the accuracy of the model significantly improve, improves if we use both, and that's because these two are diverse sensors. They capture different phenomena, and therefore they have different failure points, and so are able to complement each other quite well. So our hand might go to the mouth, but it, if it's not associated with that deep inhalation exhalation, then it is unlikely to be a smoking puff. Uh, conversely, if we have a deep inhalation exhalation for a sigh, uh, then, uh, and if our hand is not reaching the mouth, then again, this, may not, this will be ruled out as a puff. Uh, there could be some scenarios of a yawn where our hand is reaching the mouth, is staying there for a little bit, and then coming back down, and there is deep inhalation and exhalation. 
uh, and those could could potentially be those isolated puffs. Uh, <clears throat> the the I mean, uh, so if we pick one point on the ROC curve uh, here, we have true positive rate of 97% and false positive rate of 1.1%, and that's the uh, that's the uh, I mean, uh, uh, operating point we we chose to implement in our model and applied that on the test data in the field. So what we wanted, I mean, what do we have from the test data in the field? What we have is uh, participants were asked to self-report when they lapsed. They also provided CO verification each day of the three post-quit days. So they visited the lab each day and provided a, a breath sample for CO verification. So we have two sources of independent reports of a smoking lapse. One is their self-report if they did report by themselves. Second, their breath samples and CO verification the next day after their lapse. So the granularity of detection that we have is basically uh, on the order of either I mean, when they reported, which could be I mean, uh, minutes or hours from the lapse time, actual lapse time, or the CO verification, which could be about, eight, uh, about, about 24 hours or I mean, up to 24 hours away from the lapse time. So what can we do out of this? So, I mean, we know that uh, I mean, we can detect whether they lapse on a particular day or not from the CO verification, and that's what we use for, as our gold standard or ground truth for comparison. So from that, we can say whether our model was able to detect the lapse on the previous day when they lapsed. And if we missed detecting the previous day, then that will represent a false alarm. We can also look at the abstinent smokers. They, we know that abstinent smokers did not lapse. And so any smoking episode detected on the abstinent smokers, that represents a false alarm. So what we compute from the smoking cessation data is accuracy in terms of, are we able to detect the lapse episodes when the CO verification indicates that they have lapsed? And then for false alarm, we look at the uh, abstinent smokers and we look at the number of false positive uh, uh, false episodes detected per day on them so that's how we use both of these uh, i mean uh, both of these uh, populations within the smoking cessation data so on uh, the abstinent smokers and the lapsers so for the detection of first lapse as i said we were able to detect 28 out of 32 of uh, I mean, lapse episodes. Uh, one, uh, so we had 33 lapses, but for one of those cases, the data was missing. So uh, therefore, we had only 32 usable uh, data from uh, usable data from 32 uh, lapsers. Uh, if we used a risk-only model, then that was able to detect uh, only 24 out of 32. Not bad, but uh, I mean, uh, certainly not, uh, I mean, not as good as the puff marker when we use both. In terms of false positive per day, we have, as we, as I mentioned, the false positive per day was one every six days when the model was tested on those uh, participants who abstained for all three days. And for the risk only model, uh, I mean, the false positive rate is actually higher. It is one every uh, 1.7 days or uh, I mean, roughly one every two days. So now that we have a timing of the first lapse detected by the model, uh, which still needs to go further validation, and I can describe that a little bit later in response to questions, uh, we looked at how inaccurate were the uh, self-reports of a smoking lapses. So first we noticed that out of these 28, uh, 28 lapsers, <clears throat> Uh, nine of them, they did not self-report by themselves. But when they were tested positive on CO the next day, that's when they were asked to recall as to when they might have lapsed the previous day. And those are the ones on the top and the, the ones at the bottom, the blue ones, those are the, uh, the participants who self-reported their lapse episodes. We see that there is wide variation in terms of how uh, I mean, off uh, they were with respect to the, I mean, how promptly they reported their lapse episodes. Uh, here we see that at least from this analysis that in several cases, we see their report coming before their lapse detection. So that raises a question, is it possible that uh, I mean, the model is picking up lapse episodes, but uh, I mean, it might mistake the second lapse to be the first lapse? So uh, in which case, uh, I mean, 
in which case that uh, it might the report may have come earlier when the first lapse may have happened that may have consisted of only two puffs uh, but uh, the model only picked up the next one which may consist of more than four uh, uh, four uh, puffs and as i had said uh, in this population at least if we if we uh, retrain the model so that it is trained to detect uh, all episodes cons consisting of two or more puffs then each uh, from, uh, smoking episode is detected accurately or each uh, lapse episode is detected so we also looked at as to how i mean after first lapse uh, from, we know that most uh, of the smokers they go back to becoming uh, daily smokers so how does this progression happen on the lapse day on average they take about 7.7 .7 puffs on the second day after lapse they take about 26 puffs so in huge increase from the lapse day and then the second day after lapse day they take about 39 puffs and uh, when they were regularly smoking then they take about 147 puffs this study was only three days so therefore in future studies we can look at this progression or uh, I mean, we can aim to fill this uh, fill the gap between the second day after lapse and the regular smoking as to how this uh, progression takes place uh, <clears throat> So uh, other uh, findings. So first, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this model detected 28 out of 32 lapses, uh, and there was one uh, one, uh, one participant for which the data was not available. Then, if we look at the middle figure, uh, it shows a variation in lapse time. So if about uh, I mean. Uh, <clears throat> So no lapse within three days, that was 28 participants, and uh, I mean, lapse on the first day was 17, and lapse on second day was 12, and lapse on third day was four. So among the lapses, the majority of them happened on the first day. If we, uh, in this uh, model, we asked the participants to wear the uh, wrist sensor on both wrists. And, uh, I mean, so, and here we wanted to see as to, uh, I mean, what impact does it have on the detection accuracy? So is it possible that some participants we uh, smoke on uh, using only one hand? If so, which hand? Uh, and, uh, or do participants switch hands? So what we see here is that out of this, uh, this participants that we have 61, 33 of them, they smoke with the right hand. So if the smart watch that they wear is on their left hand for these participants, then we are going to miss all of their smoking episodes. Uh, 18 of them smoke with left hand. So vice versa, on these 18 participants, if left hand is their dominant hand and they wear the smart watch on their right hand, then again, we are going to miss all of these episodes. And then interestingly, there are 10 participants who switch hands. Uh, I mean, so, so we still find utility in having the participants, at least in these research studies, wear this smart watches on both wrists, not just one wrist unless it is established uh, and if they are going to use only one smartwatch then our suggestion will be to have them wear this smartwatch on their dominant hand there are several limitations of this uh, study because I mean, as, as i said uh, 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 we need better ground truth or better validation so first uh, i mean uh, we note that the model accuracy reduces for detecting first lapses that consists of three or fewer puffs so that means there will be more false alarm rate if the if we train the model to detect fewer puffs than four. Uh, uh, if people share some share, share cigarettes, then the time between successive puffs will basically be, become unusually long, and in that case, the model may not work uh, in, in in such instances. It also may not work uh, directly for detecting uh, cigars or e-cigarettes or hookah or. I mean, whose pattern might be different so the model will need to be retrained for those and so in in summary i mean the this model in its current form uh, will need to be retrained if the interrupt of duration is too long or too short compared to the training data that this model was trained on so, uh, there are lots of improvements that can be made to the model uh, we certainly would like the model to get as close to the ideal scenario as possible in terms of having a very low false positive rate and having a very high recall rate uh, with as uh, as uh, I mean, few puffs required for a episode to be considered a smoking episode as possible. The wrist only model, uh, I mean, if we can get that to become very accurate, even if, I mean, even if we can get it to be as accurate as this puff marker model is right now, that will be a huge advancement and, and enhance the convenience of a smoking detection. 
we still need to deal with this hand switching scenario when people switch hands if we if they are going to wear the sensor on only one of their hands assuming it is dominant hand uh, the model will will still need calibration or retraining to detect such scenarios and then there are several uh, of ideas that are contained in this work with respect to how to analyze the data or the inertial sensor data from the accelerometer and gyroscope worn on the smart uh, on the uh, wrists. Several smart watches do come with these six uh, six sensors, uh, accelerometers and gyroscope. And so, if we can uh, leverage the advances here and build upon it to uh, build detectors or improve the accuracy of detecting eating, brushing, flossing, these other behaviors that also involve wrist movements, then it will significantly improve the utility of smart watches. Of course. Uh, both well behavior, I mean, self monitoring as well as health monitoring. The next step, uh, uh, there is uh, going to be a lab study with, uh, conducted by Dr. Bonnie Spring at Northwestern University uh, that uh, whose data can be used to improve the model further. Uh, <clears throat> Then for validation in the field, the, uh, the model will be implemented on the mobile phone and the participants will be prompted when the model detects a smoking episode and the participants can confirm refute. Uh, that can help, uh, uh, help improve the comparison or uh, I mean, obtain better uh, data on the false alarm rate. And then to capture uh, I mean, the, the missed uh, detections, if we can have uh, CO samples rather than taken daily uh, I mean, once, if we can have multiple CO samples taken daily in the field, that can help find uh, any missed detections by the model. And then uh, I mean, each year, seven, I mean, uh, 75 new participants will be studied in MD2K and uh, the sensor-based predictors will be discovered. So if we apply the puff marker model, we can find the timing of the first lapse. Using that, we can find predictors uh, that, uh, that uh, happened just prior to the smoking lapse, and they can be incorporated in the next year's study to improve sensor-triggered just-in-time intervention. So we are starting with just-in-time stress intervention, and then we plan to add uh, triggers out of GPS data, triggers out of eyeglasses data, which can capture cues uh, or the cue exposure. So now to uh, conclude, there are several mobile sensors that exist, uh, which we are using in MD2K, uh, smart watches, test bands, and uh, smart eyeglasses, as well as sensors on the smartphone, such as GPS. So they can provide a lot of information on exposures, uh, I mean, and they can also capture uh, a variety of different behaviors and, and uh, which can be risk factors, and then they can capture outcomes as well. So together, the mobile sensors provide us an abil uh, I mean, uh, three abilities. One is early detection of, of uh, health outcomes, and uh, I mean, if we can detect, then we can act upon it. So an example that I presented would be detection of first lapse, which can be used as a trigger to launch counseling to bring the back, um, participant back to becoming an abstinent smoker again. Then prediction uh, uh, and prevention. So that means if we can find uh, I mean the, uh, the predictors of a first lapse in this case, then we can use that to uh, deliver interventions to preempt a first lapse. And that indeed will be, uh, I mean, will help prevent the first lapse. That's, uh, that's what is uh, one of our aims. And then we can use the variety of different exposures and the context captured by the, by the sensors, such as when the user is driving, when the user is talking, when the user is at work, and, and so on. Those can be used to contextualize the delivery of the intervention so that intervention is delivered at the most opportune moment. So we are looking at two different applications in MD2K. First one that we discussed was about a smoking cessation. And the second application is that of congestive heart failure that operates in the similar paradigm of first detecting congestion early with easy sense sensors. And uh, once we can understand the progression in the lung fluid status in congestive heart failure patients and we monitor the behaviors, we can look at the impact of these various behaviors and exposures on worsening or improving the congestion status, which can then be again used for uh, uh, prediction and prevention. So uh, with that, I would, uh, I, mean, I would conclude this uh, talk. Uh, if you're interested in knowing further about MD2K, you can look at the MD2K site. And if you're interested in keeping 
uh, up to date or would like to be informed of MD2K events, you can email info at md2k.org. I'd like to conclude here. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take questions. So while people think about questions, why don't we allow Najir to talk about what happens if we use this current model to detect single puffs or single puff labs? Or single puff labs. So, hello. So our puff marker model can detect single puff, but while constructing the episode, if we uh, consider single puff as a uh, smoking episode, then in this particular data set, we get uh, 496 puffs in uh, about 84 days, 84 abstinent days. So it is uh, about six uh, smoking episode per day. So we are getting six false alarm or false episode per day. Uh, so our uh, false alarm increases about 60, uh, 36, per, uh, 36 times. But if we uh, consider uh, at least four puffs, then our false alarm is uh, like uh, what Dr. Kumar mentioned, that uh, one false episode uh, in six days. So it increases about uh, 36 per, uh, times. So let me just, uh, I mean, uh, just summarize that. Just summarize that. So what Najir mentioned is so that, uh, mentioned is that uh, if instead of asking for, for uh, four pups to be there in each episode for it to be detected by the model, if uh, it's only, uh, if each puff is detected independently, then uh, as I mentioned, there could be several different things that we do in daily life. There are 2,000 hand-to-mouth gestures per day. Uh, so uh, some of them, like as I said, I mean, say yawning. I mean, uh, where uh, we take hand to the mouth, and there is uh, similar changes in the uh, in the respiration, could be mistaken as a, as a puff. So when uh, he applied the model onto the data collected on this uh, abstinent smokers, uh, 28 abstinent smokers. Uh, who were observed for three days, so that means total of 84 percent days. Uh, then what he was able, uh, what he found was that the model produced a false, uh, I mean, false positive rate. That means detected a false puff episode. There were no puff episodes on these abstinent smokers, so detected a false episodes of about six such episodes every day, uh, as opposed to one episode, one false episode every six days. So there'll be a significant increase in the false alarm rate, but the model uh, I mean, can be uh, retrained for that detection. So there certainly is, uh, I, mean, I also would like to point out that at, the, at least in this population, the minimum number of pups in the first laps were two. And if so, then uh, I mean, just by having the model uh, detect every episode that consists of at least two or more pups, as uh, we discussed, the um, <clears throat> false episode per day reduces to one. Uh, I mean, one false episode every 1.6 days. So, significant reduction in false alarm can happen if we uh, ask the model to detect those episodes that consist of two or more puffs. So, going from one to two is a huge improvement. Are there any questions? I have one. I when it comes to formulating the interventions, how, how do you see those occurring? So there are two. Uh, so one is proactive intervention, the other is reactive intervention. So reactive interventions can be launched upon detection of first labs. For proactive interventions, that's what is more promising and more complicated. So for those, uh, we first need, need data from user studies on which the model can be applied to find the timing of the first lapses. And when we find the timing of the first lapses, then we can identify the events that occur before, or unusual events that are seen to be occurring prior to the first lapse. And if they are indeed uniquely occurring prior to the first lapse, then they form unique signatures as being predictors or precursors to 
first lapses, and if so, they can be used as triggers for proactive interventions that can aim to preempt the first lapse.